Okay, so um, in the second hour, uh, we are going to learn something called Minkowski sums, and we are going to uh, learn a linear time algorithm to compute the Minkowski sum of two convex polygons. All right, and the uh, algorithm that we are going to talk about is very similar to a technique uh, called rotating calipers where we uh, rotate two parallel uh, lines simultaneously. So I wrote it in the chat box. Uh, actually, we will, we will not have, like, in the calipers, like algorithm, we will not have two parallel lines, actually. It will just be, in that regard, it will be, like, uh, yeah, it will, in, we will have two polygons uh, that we are rotating simultaneously. Uh, it will it will be similar to that, actually. The, if you look at the algorithms, uh, pseudocode, it will be similar to rotating calipers, where uh, we can this uh, technique. We haven't talked about this before, but it can be used to find the diameter of a convex polygon in linear time. Uh, if you're interested in this, you can search on the web for rotating calipers, but uh, we will see a linear time algorithm, and I will talk about the details of this algorithm to compute the Minkowski sum of two polygons. But first, uh, let's define what a Minkowski sum is. Uh, Minkowski sum, so our, our goal will be in the configuration space to compute this uh, shaded area, which is com containing the dark shaded area and this light shaded area as well. So this will be our forbidden space in the configuration space. And uh, if you look at this, uh, you can actually find it by uh, sliding your robot's polygon around it. And uh, it will have different number of vertices, as you can see. But how uh, it's computed by using Minkowski sums, uh, we are going to see next. And the Minkowski sum is defined uh, between uh, two sets. Okay, this Minkowski sum of two sets, S1 and S2. If this S1 is uh, contains two dimensional points and S2 contains two dimensional points, uh, like uh, vectors, two dimensional vectors. The Minkowski sum of S1 and S2 is defined as a set. So this is set comprehension if you look at this. For all points that belong to set 1 and for all points that belong to set 2, you just sum these points as vector addition. You just add the two vectors of these two points and form a new set. And this new set becomes the Minkowski sum. So it seems like uh, for convex polygon, I mean, for any, since this is like the set, in the set comprehension, we have all the elements of uh, set one and all the elements of set two. We just uh, it's like a Cartesian product of these two sets, but uh, the only difference is that the different members, different points from the different two sets are added, not uh, some product or uh, we don't create tuples. We just add those vectors and create a new set. It seems like the cardinality of the Minkowski sum is the, the product of the cardinalities of S1 and S2. But uh, what we will do is if we have uh, in our new... Uh, since uh, polygons are sets of vertices, which are sets of points, when we define the Minkowski sum uh, as also a polygon, if the sets of points here in this... Uh, in, in this Minkowski sum set, if those points, they define a polygon, and if we define uh, a polygon edge to be the maximal straight line, which doesn't include any points inside, then uh, the cardinality of the Minkowski sum actually is not going to be the product of S1 and S2. So uh, we can actually try to see it on an example that uh, I did yesterday in se section 2. We can actually uh, work on a similar example. Uh, let's have uh, two polygons and let's try to compute their Minkowski sum. This time I'm going to give some smaller numbers. Let's uh, have, for example, a, rectang uh, a rectangle here uh, and let's give some coordinates to it. 1, 1. Uh, let's give, for, uh, for example, this may be 3, 1 and this may be 1, 2 and 3, 3, 2. Okay, so let's have a rectangle. Uh, 
with in these coordinates okay a rectangle 2 by 1 uh, rectangle uh, width of 2 and height of 1 and let's have a triangle uh, somewhere here uh, okay let's have this triangle uh, at 5 0 uh, this vertex uh, this vertex is at 7 0 and let's have oh uh, this one actually it's not doesn't look there at the same height but let's assume this one is also 6 1 all right this this point so I have in other words I have two sets uh, of polygons and one set contains these coordinates as points 1 1 uh, 3 1 so as you can see it's uh, the set of uh, R square I have two dimensional points 1 2 and uh, 3 2 so one set is a set of these points and the other set is a set of uh, these points 5 0 the xy coordinate uh, 7 0 and 6 1 so let's compute the Minkowski sum of uh, this rectangle with this triangle which I'm going to uh, by using that definition of Minkowski sum with the set comprehension uh, I'm going to have uh, 12 points all right but what I'm going to show you is that the resulting Minkowski sum polygon is not going to have 12 vertices uh, I can actually tell you that it's going to have six vertices by uh, looking at these two things. It may, and I can, one of our theorem in this section is going to say that if we have two convex polygons, their Minkowski sum uh, may contain at most uh, uh, the summation of their vertices. For example, if this, this is four, this is three, uh, it may contain at most seven vertices. And if we have some parallel edges, for example, the base of this triangle is parallel to uh, this one in this direction. Uh, they are the, uh, the it has the edges in this minus y direction. The extreme edges they they are parallel to each other. Actually, this top edge is also parallel to this one. But we will be talk, talking about extremeness, extremities of uh, these polygons in certain directions. And in in minus y direction, in this zero, if you look at this direction vector, which is uh, zero minus one, which is this minus y axis. Okay, uh, in that direction. Uh, this the points on this edge are the bottommost points in this rectangle and the points on this edge of this triangle are the most extreme the bottommost points in this triangle so uh, therefore uh, we will have since these two both of these two edges are parallel to each other we will actually have uh, a less number of vertices in our uh, final final Minkowski sum. We will have six vertices and let's see what, what they are. So let's try to write all the 12 vertices that is the uh, result of these Minkowski sum. Let's add this 1-1 one, one to all of it. So I'm going to have 6-1 okay and then 8-1 uh, 8-1 and 7-2 so I have these three and then let's add three one to all of them so eight one ten one and nine two so this is the other uh, this one is added now I'm going to so I have six of them so let's add one two to all of them six two Eight two and seven three, and the last one is three two, which is just uh, going to be eight two, and uh, then I'm going to have a ten two, right? Yeah, ten two, and then nine three. So these are my 12 vertices 
uh, in my Minkowski sum. Now, uh, let's try to plot them where they are. Uh, okay, so actually there are some duplicate, duplicates here, 8 ones, uh, 8 twos, uh, they will just be the same. So this, the, from here you can see that the number of vertices are not going to be uh, equal to uh, 12. Uh, but let's let's try to just plot them. 6, six 1 is uh, here, this point, let's do we call this 6 1. So I'm going to have 8 1, which is, sorry, 8 1 is somewhere here. So this is 8 1. 6 2, uh, let's have 6 2 here. So, and 8, 7 2, it's here. And I have 8, 2 and 9, 2, right? Look at this. 6, 2, 7, 2, 8, 2 and 9, 2. So here, these four points are collinear. So what will happen is that they will appear uh, on the same edge. So the points, which are actually 7, 2 and uh, 8, 2, they are going to be on this edge. And they will not be a vertex of our Minkowski sum uh, polygon. So we will not have these. So 7, 2 is gone. Uh, 8, 2 is gone. This is not a vertex because they are in on the edge. And uh, let's remove the duplicates. One of the duplicates, 8, 1 appears twice. Uh, we are not going to have it's two vertices at the same point. And uh, also, well, I had another duplicate, right? Yeah, uh, this 8, 2 uh, is, was a duplicate that, that's removed uh, due to this one. Also, it was removed due to this being uh, on the linear. Now, uh, I also have uh, linear points. So, so let's, so what do I have here? 6, 1, 6, 2. So, this is 6, 1. This is, let's, let's just plot them. And 8, 1, 6, 7, 8. So 8, 1 is this one. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I have uh, the 6 to 10, 1. So I have uh, at x coordinate 10, we can have it somewhere here 10, 1, uh, 10, 2. So 10, 1, 10, 2. Oh, actually, 9, 2 is also gone, uh, yeah, because it's on the same line as, so starting from, uh, so 7, 2, 8, 2, 9, 2. 9, 2 is also, so this was 7, 2, 8, 2, and 9, 2. They are, all of them are gone because they are on the same line of this one. And I have uh, 7, 3, which is somewhere here, and 9, 3. So this is 9, 3. 7, 3, okay, and 10, 2 is this one, yeah, it's I think going to be something like this, yeah, I have, actually I have 10, 1, so 8, 1 is also on the same line, so 8, 1 is also gone, they're from 6, 1 to 10, 1, they're, they're collinear, so it's going to be something like this. Okay, so this is my final, let me just use a different color pen to indicate my Minkowski sum. So my Minkowski sum polygon is going to be something like this. What I have here is, if you look at the edges of this Minkowski sum, some of the edges are actually due to the edges of this rectangle. These vertical edges are uh, the extremities due to these two. And uh, they're actually, uh, and these two uh, edges are due to the edges of this uh, triangle. Uh, they are actually, they, I, I couldn't draw it like that, but they are actually parallel to the edges. They, this edge here is parallel to this edge, and this upper edge is due to uh, this one here. Okay, and the lower edge, uh, the bottom edge of this Minkowski sum is due to both of them. So I have, as you can see, one, two, two, three, three, four, five, six vertices. So in my Minkowski sum, I will have 
uh, six vertices. All of them, all of them are accounted for, right? Seven three is there, and this eight two is gone. Uh, this is also because it was linear. Six two is here. One two three four five six. So these are the six vertices of my Minkowski sum. Yeah, nine two should also be deleted because it's uh, on. So there, we don't have an edge that is like this inside the Minkowski sum. So this edge, which contains seven two eight two and nine two, uh, they are all collinear with from six two to eight two. So they're not extreme in that direction. So they appear to be some. Uh, it appears to be a vertex inside the polygon so we just we are going to just think about the extreme uh, vertices that de define as vertices so these are all of them are deleted okay so the, the Minkowski sum actually is this polygon that is around it you can you shouldn't think about Minkowski sum actually as the convex half of these things because if uh, Minkowski sum is also defined on non-convex polygons and the resulting Minkowski sum may be a non-convex polygon. Let me show you a, a Minkowski sum uh, here. Look at this. If uh, this is my uh, one of my polygons, this is the other polygon which is non-convex. The resulting Minkowski sum is going to be this, and it's as you can see, it's not convex. Uh, in other words, we're not computing the convex hull of points to define the Minkowski sum. But yeah, the, uh, if uh, they are, uh... oh, this very good question actually, Alper. So why do we need the Minkowski sum, right? So first we define that we are, we are actually coming to that point. So why do we need this Minkowski sum to solve this problem? Uh, we are going to do this. The configuration space obstacle, let's call it CP. So we have real obstacles in uh, obstacle polygons in the workspace. Imagine you're given the a polygon, which is an obstacle in the workspace. We, 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 our goal is to find out the configuration space obstacle uh, due to a robot's polygon. Imagine the robot's polygon is given to us as a polygon in its, in its resting position at 0, 0. Okay, so this this will indicate a polygon where the robots robots is actual, transformation is actually at zero zero. So this this also defines a polygon, the polygon of the robot, the vertices of the robot polygon is defined by this set. Imagine this is a set that defines our robot at its resting position, and this is a workspace polygon obstacle. Now. The forbidden space due to this polygon in the configuration space will be defined by the Minkowski sum of P with minus R0. Okay, so we will use the Minkowski sum that I defined here will be used to find this, the configuration space obstacle. So we, when you make the Minkowski sum with P with this minus r minus r will be for example if your uh, uh, if your robot is something like this uh, it's configured uh, in, in its resting position minus r will be like a, a polygon which is reflected with respect to origin okay so minus r is defined as if you just negate all of your points it's right here let me show you we also need to define what the minus operation does Okay, so if for a point, if we have a point, uh, yeah, if we have a point PXY, sorry, if we have a point PXY, uh, minus P uh, is just multiplying the vector with minus 1, okay, it's, it also means that reflecting the point with respect to origin in this uh, space. So, and reflecting an entire set, so minus R is actually uh, negating an entire set of points, uh, the, the polygon, polygon uh, points. What it will mean is that negating all of the points of our robot. So it will mean reflection with respect to origin. Now, here is the theorem. So I think this answers your uh, question uh, because our goal will be uh, to figure out the configuration space obstacle. So our goal is to find given a polygon 
null robot like this, given a workspace obstacle, which is this darker shade of uh, polygon here. What is the configuration space obstacle that is that also contains this shaded region around it? And after we have this configuration space obstacle, in the, on the configuration, we, if we build a trapezoidal map, map on the configuration space, it, we can actually use the method that we have developed in section 13.2 for a point robot. Because in the configuration space, we are trying to find the path for a point. In the configuration space, everything is a point. So it's like turning our polygonal robot into a point in the configuration space. Okay, so that's that's the uh, that's what uh, we are uh, trying to find, and therefore uh, the configuration space obstacles. In order to find these expanded obstacles, we, this, that's why we uh, define these Minkowski sums. And the Minkowski sum, in the, if you look at this theorem 13.3. It becomes uh, for every polygonal uh, workspace obstacle, you just uh, Minkowski sum that obstacle with uh, minus r00 to find a configuration space obstacle. And the proof of this theorem is actually very simple, uh, short, but it's not that simple, uh, but it's short. And we are going to, I'm just uh, not going to skip this, I'm going to talk about the proof in detail why this is the case why P Minkowski sum minus R gives a configuration space obstacle. Uh, we are going to prove that next. Okay, uh, and the proof actually uh, is, uh, is trying to prove this statement. Uh, we have to prove that. I mean, if, if something is a configuration space obstacle, I mean, if, if this Minkowski sum is a configuration space obstacle, it means that uh, at a certain particular uh, point, within this configuration space, our rectangle at that particular configuration, for example, if xy is a forbidden configuration, it means that rxi intersects p. Uh, if this xy is an element of that Minkowski sum. And we need to prove this statement from both sides. Okay, it's uh, so are the, the workspace. So here is the, uh, the first part of the statement is about the workspace. In the workspace, if your robot in uh, translate, if it's translated XY amount, if it intersects with P, it means that XY is a forbidden configuration. All right, so in, in the workspace. Now, if you think about what happens in the configuration space, it means that, I mean, if, if this really is a configuration space obstacle, then that forbidden configuration of XY should be inside that configuration space obstacle. All right. So, and we need to prove this both ways. So if you pick, if you start from the configuration space and pick any point within it, that configuration should cause an intersection in the workspace. Or if any configuration that you move your robot in the workspace causes a collision, then that configuration should appear in the forbidden configuration space that you have constructed with this Minkowski sum. That's why we, have, uh, we, have, we are proving this statement with an if and only if by starting from uh, both sides. So we will first uh, start from the workspace. Suppose that, so we first suppose that moving our robot XY amount from its resting position, uh, we, we move it XY amount, X to the right, Y to the up, and in the workspace, R, our robot's polygon, intersects with an obstacle polygon. All right, and let Q, if there's an, if the intersection is not empty, if the area is non zero, let Q be a point inside this intersection, okay? So Qx, Qy, let's choose one of the points within that collision. So our robot collides with the obstacle. Let's choose a point uh, from this collision area, okay? Let's call it Qx, Qy. So since uh, it's, an inter it's, it's an intersection of uh, Rx, Y, and P, it means that Q is an element of Rx, Y, uh, in that of that polygon, Q also is an element of P. So Q is an element of both RXY and P. So what we what we do is uh, we can actually uh, if Q is an element of RXY, 
if we move the entire polygon along with Q, so if we move the entire system, X units to the left and Y units to the right, in other words, if you subtract X and Y from your Q, it will be an element of uh, the polygon in its resting position, right? I mean, if you choose a point Q uh, in the moved, uh, so if this is my uh, polygon and I moved it here, if I choose a point Q in it, if I move the polygon back to its original position, x, y amount, q also moves along with it, which means that this qx minus x and qy minus y should be a member of the resting polygon. And if I also reflect this entire uh, region, if you multiply the, your rectangle with minus 1, so minus r, if you'll take a look at this minus r, which means that if you reflect this point, x minus qx and y minus qy, it becomes if you multiply the left-hand side with minus from both of them, so it means that you perform a reflection transformation or you scale it with, my, with minus 1, you get this point. So if the, this point here, as you can see, is exactly the negative of this point here, x minus qx and y minus qy, and it should be uh, also, if the, the entire since the entire thing is reflected, it should be a member of the uh, reflected polygon. So we, we just established that this point here, minus qx x and minus qy y, is an element of this minus r0,0. Since we also know that qx qy is a point on the uh, original polygon, what we can now do is... Uh, we can add qx, qy to the left-hand side and also to the right-hand side, which is a, is a Minkowski sum. So if you add p to this one, I mean, without loss of generality, actually you can take this qx, qy to be an extreme point uh, in, in R, okay? So, uh, and it may also be an extreme point in, in P as well. So, okay, so, so we can, since it's in the intersection of these two things, so what, but what we basically did was, in order to jump from here to this, the, the different thing in these two steps is that we added QX, QY on the left-hand side. And since we know QX, QY is a member of this P, uh, we also, it means that P, a, a, a member of, uh, so QX, QY, added to this one, the Minkowski sum, it's, it means that uh, this x, y is an element of this one, okay? So the step from here to here uh, takes into account that we add to the, we add to the left-hand part, we just add to this tuple qx, qy, another tuple, and that's, that addition is defined by Minkowski sum. Uh, so if you add, if you add a point uh, on the left-hand side qx, qy, the left-hand side tuple, these two vectors, after edit, it becomes x, y. And the right-hand side becomes p, Minkowski sum, minus r. So uh, we just prove, have proven the first part. If in the workspace, if our x, y is intersects p, then that uh, there is a point. Uh, then then, v, then uh, x, y, if our x, y intersects p, uh, this x, y, should be an element of this Minkowski sum, okay? It doesn't mean x, y being an element of this Minkowski sum doesn't mean that it's a vertex of this Minkowski sum, okay? Actually, uh, it's a, we are actually abusing the mathematical notation a little bit uh, because uh, here the sets are uh, defined here. I mean, if the Minkowski sum was a set, right? Uh, but we just treat it as if it's a polygon with an interior area, okay? So here, this Minkowski sum actually denotes the polygon itself with the area inside it, all right? So xy being an element of this doesn't mean that xy is a vertex of this. It means that xy is in the Minkowski sum polygon. All right, so this is a little bit actually uh, abuse of mathematical notation because we first defined Minkowski sum to be sets, but now we treat in this theorem, uh, we treat this uh, as, a, as a polygon with the interior area as well. All right, so let's just uh, take a note of this subtle uh, subtlety uh, uh, which uh, takes this Minkowski sum not as a set of vertices, 
but actually as an area, all right? And maybe thinking about this as an area, that's why these uh, eight two uh, seven two eight two nine two is deleted because they are inside the area uh, of composed by this polygon. Even if it was concave, not non-convex, if some point happens to be inside the area, then uh, it's not uh, represented as a vertex of the Minkowski sum. Okay, now the second part of the theorem now starts from the configuration space. We choose a point from the forbidden configuration space. So let's choose a point x, y, this time from inside the forbidden configuration space defined by this Minkowski sum. All right. Then uh, we, are, we need to prove that this x, y is in the intersection of rxy and p which means that it's a uh, rx this xy uh, is an element is a member of rxy and also it should be an element of uh, it should be an element of uh, p as well so here uh, is the uh, statement that proves this if uh, this is uh, if xy is an element of this it means that there ha there has to be some point rx ry which is a member of uh, R0, 0, because it's defined as the Minkowski sum. If you just negate this Rx, Ry, it becomes minus Rx, minus Ry. And there should be points Px, Py element of P such that this Xy is Px minus Rx and Py is minus Ry, right? So this, again, the first sentence, uh, part actually the first half of the sentence, follows from the definition of Minkowski sums. If... Uh, uh, the Minkowski sum states that this Minkowski sum, if you just pick a point in uh, Rx, Ry, which is a member of this R0, 0, okay, if you just pick a point Rx, Ry from this configuration and from this polygon, and if you pick another point Px, Py from this polygon, the Minkowski sum states that this Xy uh, may be, uh, Xy can be driven uh, from px minus rx, so this Minkowski sum just add these two points, uh, px minus rx, py minus ry. So there should ex there, there should be ex at least one point uh, that satisfies this equation for xy to be a member of this, okay, to, to be an element of this. So if xy is equal to px minus rx and py, uh, py minus ry, uh, which means that we can actually uh, put certain points around here, which means that Px is actually equal to Rx minus X, or, or, sorry, we put Rx to the left-hand side, so Px should be equal to X plus Rx, and Py should be equal to R plus y, y. So what does this tell us? This tells us that if you take a point in your original polygon and move it X units to the right and Y units above, right? Actually, this is exactly what that means. If you pick a point in your original robot configuration, which was Rx and Ry, if you move that point x units to the right, y units above, where do you end up? You end up at a point Px, Py. What is that point? It was a point inside P, which means that you're intersecting your polygon. So this is what it means, which implies that Rx, Y intersects P. So this uh, theorem states that uh, the configuration space the forbidden configuration space actually is the Minkowski sum of the workspace polygon with the reflection of your robot's polygon. Uh, okay, so in this resting position. So this establishes uh, why uh, we need uh, we have this notion of Minkowski sum to uh, to to get these things. So in order this area that is around here, the forbidden space. It is the Minkowski sum of your robot's polygon reflected uh, with the workspace polygon. And the, the rest is just how do we compute this? How do we compute the Minkowski sum? So uh, the, the, the Minkowski sum, uh, you're welcome, uh, by the way. Uh, so actually, th that's the most part of the lecture was about uh, this, why, why we need Minkowski sum. So that was a, a question uh, that was really relevant. Uh, so now the next is just how do we compute it? And I just showed you 
uh, a method on this slide how to compute it, which is actually quadratic running time. If you have two vertices, which is which is uh, I mean two polygons with n vertices and m vertices, you just uh, list all you just do the Cartesian product of the of the vertices. And uh, just then after that, uh, you determine the vertices of your Minkowski sum. So it takes, as you can see, quadratic time. If both of them are uh, n vertices, um, it will take uh, n squared time, for example. For two triangles, you would need to get uh, nine vertices, so three squared uh, for a triangle. So uh, in this section, we are going to see an algorithm uh, see an algorithm to reduce this quadratic time to linear time. We will be able to compute the Minkowski sum of two convex polygons in linear time, actually, uh, which is a, also the complexity of the Minkowski sum itself. For that, there are certain some, some observations about Minkowski sums. Uh, the first one is uh, this observation. If uh, we have two convex polygons, P and R, in the plane, uh, their Minkowski sum, uh, it let, their Minkowski sum will be the CP. If an extreme direction, an extreme point in a certain direction, D, uh, and the extreme point in this direction, in D, in the Minkowski sum, is actually uh, the sum of uh, sorry about that. The sum of the extreme points in the respective polygons. Uh, okay, so uh, so here, if you take a direction D uh, on this Minkowski sum, a vertex, the extreme point in this direction, is actually just the summation of the extreme points in the same direction in P and R. So this. Uh, gives this will, this idea will also this observation will lead to an algorithm uh, to us. Uh, we will instead of looking at all the card all the possible pairs of vertices and trying to add all possible pairs of vertices between these two polygons, we will actually have a rotational plane sweep in which we'll just start with some extreme direction and we will jump from direction to direction. We will continuously look at all possible extremities uh, in 360 degrees. So this direction, we will start, for example, with direction minus y. Uh, for example, the extreme points in direction 0 minus 1. Consider the vector 0 minus 1, the minus y axis. The bottom most points here are the extreme points in minus y direction. So and this point you see here, actually, the Minkowski sum, is an addition of this and that. Since this coordinate is 0, 0, it makes sense. I mean, if you add 0, 0 to this point, you get the same point. So this is actually the bottom most point of our Minkowski sum, the same, the same point as this one, because the coordinate of this is 0, 0. So what we will do is we will add we will continue going over extreme points in certain directions. We will start with minus y, and we will rotate 360 degrees, covering all possible extremities in every direction. But we will see that between certain directions, discrete directions, the extremity does not change. The, whatever is the extreme point uh, in that direction, or whatever is the extreme edge in that direction, remains extreme in, in certain ranges of directions. This will allow us to have a plane sweep with certain event points. We don't need to actually uh, sweep, rotate, do rotational sweep continuously in those 360 degrees. As for example, uh, and the, the event points are actually will be the these edge the angles the edges make with the x-axis. We are going to use that. For example, r uh, for, from, from this minus y all the way to this angle this edge makes with the x-axis. Uh, the extreme point in, in all of those directions will be this r actually. Okay, so, uh, so it, let, let me directly 
jump to that observation. So this, the observation about pseudo disks is about the complexity of uh, the final Minkowski sums, but what I want to uh, talk about is this. Uh, if we consider a certain direction and another direction D2, D1 and D2, all the directions in between D1 and D2 will be a continuous sweep uh, from D1 to D2. And one observation here is that uh, if we have two convex polygons P1 and P2 with disjoint interiors and let D1 and D2 be two directions in which P1 is more extreme than P2 uh, in both of these directions, then either P1 is more extreme than P2 in all directions in the range from D1 to D2 or it is more extreme in all directions from D2 to D1. So these two things are different. So this is the direction between D1 and D2, and this is the direction, uh, all the directions between D2 and D1. We are always considering counterclockwise uh, rotation around this. So this is the all of the directions between D2 and D1. When I say all the directions between D2 and D1, I refer to these this side of the circle. When I say all the directions between D1 and D2, I refer to these, uh, this continuous region. So this observation says that if uh, a polygon is more extreme uh, in both D1 and in D2, uh, which, comparing two polygons, it's going to be always more extreme either between uh, all of the time between these uh, two things, either on this side or on this side. So this will lead us to uh, something like this. Uh, this is an example. Uh, if you, I have two convex polygons, uh, for example, this is D1, this is D2, and this is D3. All of them are uh, depicted on this circle here. Uh, in certain directions, for example, in D, for example, at uh, exactly so this is the direction D1. Between D1 and D2, so D1 is a little bit this way, D2 is a little bit more upwards. Between D1 and D2, this is the extreme point. And since they sh both P1 and P2 share that vertex, P1 and P2 are equally extreme. So if, if you take any direction between D1 and D2, you'll end up as the extreme point of these two polygons to be this vertex. So they're equally extreme in this point. But between D1 and D3, D3 if you look at, and at D3, they're also equally extreme exactly at D3. D3 is the line segment that uh, joins these two. And in the direction D3, the most extreme word points are these two points, and P1 and P2 are again equally extreme at D3. But between uh, D1 and D3, P1 is more extreme because if you look at all the directions here, P1 has points that appear, I mean, as extreme in these directions. P2 is above uh, P1, so the bottom most points are due to P1. And between D3 and uh, D2, P2 is more extreme. So in these continuous, there are continuous regions where one polygon is more extreme than the other. So. With this, we are going to actually uh, use this. Uh, this is the algorithm that uh, we'll be using to compute the Minkowski sum uh, by with this observation, which you'll see it's a, a linear algorithm. Uh, it's, it's very simple, actually. Uh, we first have these two polygons. To com let, ha let us have as input two convex polygons, P and R. Uh, in such a way that the vertices, the vertices are in counterclockwise order, and uh, the vertex that is named as V1 or W1 is the bottommost vertex, vertex in both uh, polygons. If uh, there are two vertices with the same Y coordinate, the one that's with a smaller co X coordinate comes first. So this one is the bottom left uh, vertex of polygon P, this is the bottom left vertex of polygon R. In, that, in, in, some, in a sense, W1 and V1 are extreme vertices, so their addition, V1 plus W1, should be a vertex of the Minkowski sum P, Minkowski sum R. Okay, so the output is the Minkowski sum, 
And uh, the way is, uh, we started like this, we initialized two counters, i and j. These counters, uh, i allows us to go for, for, to the next vertex on p, and j is used to go to the next vertex, which vertex we're currently in, in r, okay? Uh, in order to have a rotational uh, sweep, we also make these uh, vertex lists a chain. So Vm plus 1 becomes V2, Vm plus uh, 2 becomes v, uh, so V1, and this one becomes V2. So it becomes a circular, a cycle, a cyclic chain of vertices we have. And what we repeat until we come to the last, when until Vi becomes uh, M plus 1, we come back to the first vertices. Until we come to the first vertices, we continue uh, this loop. And at at every iteration of the loop, we do one of the three things. Either i is incremented by 1, or j is incremented by 1, or they're both incremented. Okay? So, at every iteration of the loop, one, one of these uh, counters are incremented for sure. Okay? So, in the worst case, the loop is going to run. If we don't increment them simultaneously, in the worst case, uh, the loop is going to run m plus m times, okay? If uh, one of the polygons is, contains m vertices, the other is m. So in the worst case, the loop is going to run m plus m times, which, which means it's linear in the total size of these two polygons. So let's see what we do. We, here is the statement that constructs the Minkowski sum. So when we start this uh, loop, the first thing we do is we add v1 plus w1 as a vertex of this word uh, as a vertex of this Minkowski uh, sum and then uh, but we look at the angles the net the edge vi vi plus one makes with wj w uh, j plus one that actually the, the ang this angle wi wi plus one that edge makes with the x-axis so for example when we have two polygons like this we had an example here uh, trying to find the Minkowski sum. Let's see. Yeah, for example, when we are trying to find the Minkowski sum of these two polygons, what we do is uh, v, v1 is this, this is w1. We check the angle vi, vi plus 1 is this edge, wi, wi plus 1 is this edge. So the angle in a convex polygon, the angle an edge makes with the x-axis is ordered uh, like from smallest to largest okay if you have a convex polygon this is the angle this edge makes the angle this edge makes is like more than 90 degrees as you can see with the x-axis this one is uh, close to 270 degrees this one is the angle this edge makes with the let me actually just again copy this one to GIMP and instead of using the mouse pointer let me try to draw these angles and show them to you all right i think this will do and after this algorithm i'm going to finish today's lecture all right so let me paste it here all right so the angle uh, this edge makes is this Okay, the angle this edge makes with the x-axis is this. The angle this edge makes with the x-axis is this. So just draw the x-axis here. And the angle this edge makes with the x-axis is this angle. All right? So since in a convex polygon, since we are always moving to the left, when we are going counterclockwise, you're always ma making a left turn, which means that the angle is uh, monotonically increasing. Uh, from It starts from zero all the way to 360 degrees. So in a sense, when we are given these vertices in order from V1 to Vn, uh, the edges are also sorted with respect to the angle they make with the x-axis. Now, at every iteration, we compare these two angles based on the current counters. So it's like, which if the, if this angle 
of in polygon P is smaller than the angle in polygon W. It means that uh, we are while we are sweeping uh, this uh, while we are sweeping uh, the extreme directions, we are going to hit the vertex at polygon P first. Which one is going to be uh, an extreme in that direction is determined by just comparing these two angles. If this angle is smaller, and as you can see, it can be easily computed, we, we, we increment our counter uh, on the polygon P, in which means that in the, at the beginning of the next iteration, VI plus 1 and WJ will be inserted as a vertex to our Minkowski sum. If the other angle is uh, smaller, if the angle in polygon R is smaller, then what we do is we uh, increment the counter in that polygon. If they're equal to each other, this else case is the case where we have two edges of two polygons that are parallel to each other. In that case, they will have, they will, both of the edges will be extreme in the same direction we increment both of those vertices simultaneously and the next vertices are going to be added. Their sum, their summation is going to be added to our Minkowski sum. So this is a linear algorithm to compute the Minkowski sum of two convex polygons. And what we do is we do it for our robot polygon for every workspace uh, obstacle. We compute the configuration space obstacles and then with an algorithm uh, that is defined here, uh, let me show it here, yeah, this one, the entire forbidden space is found by a divide and conquer approach to combine these uh, configuration space obstacles together, we merge them because they may intersect with each other in the configuration space. So this is a divide and conquer algorithm which finds the forbidden space of the first half, forbidden space of the second half, and then finds the union of the forbidden space each uh, of them each. So I'm not going to go into details of this actually. Uh, it becomes uh, doesn't become uh, If if a polygon is not monotone, uh, it will not be uh, convex, right? Uh, if if its edges are not monotonically uh, increasing, the, the angle uh, it makes, uh, it's not going to be uh, convex. I'm, uh, I'm, it's, it's not it's not going to be uh, convex, and we cannot use this algorithm in that case. Uh, it should not. The common extreme points will be different. It will for non-convex polygons. The Minkowski sum may result in really strange shapes, which is also non-convex. I think we will uh, just use the Cartesian product in that case. We don't need this linear algorithm because we cannot use that algorithm because the thing here is that, I let me also show you the final theorem here in this section. If both of the polygons are convex, we have linear complexity Minkowski sum and we, ha we can use we have a linear algorithm to compute this one. If only one of them is non-convex, okay, we don't need to have both of them non-convex. If one of them is convex and the other is non-convex, the resulting Minkowski sum may have uh, this many vertices. So this is the uh, number of vertices, the complexity of the Minkowski sum itself. As you can see, it's n times m. If it's that's the, if if we have non-convex polygons. Why bother trying to find the linear algorithm? Because it's impossible. The Minkowski sum, in the worst case, could have n times m vertices. So just do the Cartesian product. J just for every ver vertices between these two of them, uh, just compute those and uh, try to find the Minkowski sum from that. And one thing that is interesting here is that if both polygons are non-convex, the resulting Minkowski sum could have n square m square complexity. I mean, uh, and this one shows that worst case complexity in which some of the vertices will be defined as intersection points of these. Uh, I mean, we will have extreme points in every direction. Extreme points will be intersecting with each other. So we will introduce new vertices in addition to the Cartesian products. So the Minkowski sum itself doesn't look like a simple polygon at all. This area, if you look at this shaded area 
light shaded area P Minkowski sum R, it's not even a simple polygon. It has holes inside it, lots of holes. So it's, it's, it's complexity is too much. All right. So that's, that's, you're right. If it's not monotone, monotone, it should not have a common extreme point like this. So this common extreme point, that theorem only uh, holds for um, uh, convex polygons. All right. So this, this last part of this section, which discusses uh, what happens if one of them uh, is non-convex, it's really complicated. The Minkowski sum gets complicated. So let's just not bother trying to understand that that part. This is just this show, shows that Minkowski sums may be complex if you're not dealing with convex polygons. So the algorithm we have seen only applies for convex polygons. And uh, if you have non-convex polygons, what you can do is you can co convert them first to convex polygons. You can tr use triangulation, then. Uh, the Minkowski sum actually is distributable over, uh, there's a distribution property over union of uh, areas. So you can actually try to compute the Minkowski sums between convex things first and then find the union. And since this union is like overlay of subdivisions, this is the part where uh, complexities are going to be introduced when you find the union of these individual Minkowski sums. Okay, so what after we compute the configuration space, all we do is uh, we apply the point uh, robot algorithm we developed in section 13.2 uh, on this forbidden configuration space uh, as our obstacles. And uh, this is how we solve uh, the problem. And so here's a figure for that. So the configuration just becomes the same as point-like robot after we extend our polygons uh, to configuration space obstacles, they may intersect with each other like this, but their intersection will be only a certain way. The, the complexity of the configuration is, if we have convex polygons, it will still be linear, and we use the same algorithm. This is essentially saying that. And uh, I will just take like two more of your minutes, then I'm going to uh, finish today's lecture. Uh, is about rotations. When we have uh, rotational robots, so our configuration space becomes three-dimensional, how do we solve this case? The book just gives a heuristic about motion planning uh, with rotations, and that heuristic actually uh, is not robust. It doesn't always give the correct answer because it tries to discretize the rotational space also by only considering at discrete angles while the robot is rotating and the space is represented so here's an example scenario where you may need uh, rotations in order to find the path from start to uh, target location and uh, the way it is done is uh, yeah yeah the here is what the uh, heuristic is the heuristic suggested by the book is uh, every rotation uh, of our robot a specific rotation actually if you just fixed the angle the translation becomes a 2d configuration space so we may have a stack of 2d configuration spaces like this and uh, in this in in each of these slices in the stack of slices in a particular slice the rotation is of the robot is fixed so it becomes a translational robot within the slice so, and rotation actions are modeled as jumping from one slice to another. If you jump from one slice to another, it means that you're just doing rotation, okay? So, a path is actually found by the first building our same graphs within the slices, and two slices are connected to each other if the trapezoids of, uh, by, they just apply a, um, overlay algorithm if the trapezoids intersect uh, which means that we can jump from this free space to this free space because th these trapezoids in represent free spaces if t two trapezoids between consecutive uh, neighboring slices of when they are overlaid they intersect it means that you can rotate your robot from here to here uh, with uh, freely all right so this is what they do they introduce edges between slices if the trapezoids intersect with each other. So it, then it becomes 
uh, finding a path from some starting configuration to this ending configuration with these layered graphs. We have lots of graphs. Uh, they're all connected to each other with these edges between slices. There may be lots of edges between slices. There may not be a single edge. Between every intersecting trapezoid, between two slices, we have edges that connect them. And this becomes a huge graph, and uh, the path is found again by breadth first search in this graph. All right? So that's it from me uh, for this week. Next week, we are going to talk about how to find shortest paths on uh, a 2D map for a point-like robot. And uh, this will be our final lecture. Uh, and actually, we have two weeks of lectures left. In the final week, I'm just going to be uh, doing the same thing as I did in the midterm. Uh, I will do a final exam review. If you have any questions about any uh, chapter, uh, I will be happy to answer them in, the, in our final week, two weeks from now. And the final assignment, I will post it in a couple of days. It will, it will be a, a simple, short, written assignment, which will not take more than one, of, uh, one day of your, I mean, maybe one hour of your time. Uh, but uh, I will give two weeks uh, de deadline, so you'll be able to do it whenever you're free. And the final exam will be similar to the midterm exam. It will be a two-day take-home exam. All right, so that's it from me uh, this week. I wish all of you a happy new year, and uh, I uh, will see all of you next week, and we will talk about chapter 15 next week. All right, I will stop the recording now.